Hello. Here I am with another story in the uh, isolation literature series. Um, today's is another story from The Corset and Other Forms of Control by Mary Bridson. Um, Mary has kindly given me her consent to read this story. I hope I do it justice. If you want to read along, by the way, you can get hold of it as an e-book and um, it doesn't take too long for a paperback copy to come through as well. This one is a short story called Collision Course. Elfrida stood in front of her mirror, adjusting the red-brimmed hat with the dyed feathers. She was going with red today rather than mustard, even though she had been told yellow was more visible to traffic. Her red winter coat was buttoned up to the neck and the scarf tucked in. Almost ready. She rummaged through the closet for her scuffed leather shopping bag and checked the contents. Coin purse, candy canes, gloves, iron key handkerchief and tambourine. Better take the horn as well in case of coyotes. She let herself out the back door, crept past the living room in case a new daughter-in-law was in there and strode off up the hill. Mrs Penny fussed over her boy Timmy wiping a smear of butter off his face and poured him a second cup of hot, strong tea. Are you sure you don't want another egg, Timmy? It's no trouble. No, I don't want. Time for my bike. Timmy fidgeted in his chair till his mother sighed and conceded defeat. However else she may have failed her son, she had always tried to keep his plate filled. Ramming his Chevy cap on backwards, Timmy ran outside to fetch his five-speed from the shed. He turned on the radio in the front carrier to full blast as he wheeled it down the drive. He carefully mounted and set off down the road, as he had done every morning, weather permitting, for the last 30 years. Wayne Butler woke up, crouched in a basement stairwell. His head was fuzzy and his mouth felt like the bottom of a gravel truck. Ouch! Something was digging into his leg. He yanked his dad's old hunting knife out of his pocket. What was he carrying that around for? Through the fog in his brain, the events of last night began to emerge. Getting drunk on George Street. Buying some pills off a guy in the bar. Showing off to that girl. His buddy daring him to... Oh, Christ! He hadn't, had he? From his other pocket, he pulled out a woolly balaclava and a fistful of twenty-dollar bills. God Almighty, had he actually walked into that corner store and robbed it? He could remember standing outside with Jerry egging him on, but then his mind was a blank. In spite of the warmth of the early sun, he broke out in a cold sweat. Then... He realised this wasn't even his house. Elfrida preferred to walk up the middle of the road so no coyotes could ambush her from the ditch. The occasional car was a nuisance, but they knew her well enough to slow down and go round her. She waved regally at those she liked and shook her tambourine at the ones she, she thought had cut it too fine. There was hardly a soul out this morning, probably still sleeping off their Friday night. She stopped 
to admire the whitewashed church perched above the ocean. It was an old friend. Baptisms. Sunday school as student and teacher. Her wedding day. Her husband's funeral. All encompassed within its sturdy walls. In there... She felt more connected to her life than out in the crazy world of today. She fished the iron key out of her bag and walked up to the stained oak doors. Her grandfather had paid for those out of his ceiling money one bountiful spring. She stepped inside and felt the peace wash over her. Tapping the tambourine, almost in time, she raised her quivering voice in a hymn of praise and then yelled Amen several times over, enjoying the echoes bouncing off the high timbers. She didn't notice the parson, furtively peeking through a side window. As a young man, fresh out of Divinity College, he was intimidated by his parishioners' demand for access to the church at all times, and he had surrendered the old key. Fortunately, he had another key to the vestry door, and he scuttled in to lock up after her every day, scared that his domain would fall victim to roaming vandals if left open. Wayne limped across the road to his own house, saw the Harley belonging to his mum's boyfriend parked out front and had a flash of inspiration. He had best lie low for a while in case Jerry ratted on him and the law came looking. His nan lived round the bay. She had always spoiled him as a kid and he'd be sure, she'd be sure to take him in, no questions asked. She had no truck with his mum now anyway. He crept into the house, found the key and slipped out again. He was shaking a bit, so he popped another couple of pills to shore up his courage. He nearly fell under the full weight of the machine as he knocked the prop out but managed to get it upright. He flung his leg over, kicked the starter and the beast roared into action. He fled down the street, round the corner and headed for the highway. Coming back down the hill from the church, Elfrida spotted the professor out walking his Doberman, Carl. She beamed and hurried towards him, blowing her horn to catch her at his attention. Dr Morrison inwardly groaned at his bad timing. Elfrida had taken a shine to him the first time he visited the community to collect material for his folklore thesis. She had plied him with tales, morbid, romantic, tragic, libelous, ridiculous, about neighbours, ancestors, monsters and ghosts. He was never quite sure what to believe, but he had mined them for some anecdotal nuggets, and for that he was grateful. He had settled in the village after getting tenure at the university and now he was paying the price. Professor, have a candy cane, said Elfrida, marching across the road, rummaging in her bag. Put them on your Christmas tree for the children. Elfrida, it's July. Professor, nonsense. Here, take them. She tried to stuff them in his pocket. Carl snarled and half choked himself on the leash to get her. 
That dog needs more exercise. You should set it on the coyotes, not old ladies. Hey, Freddy! The yell was almost drowned out by the blaring rock music of Timmy's radio as he wobbled up to them in the middle of the road. He made a grab for the candy canes. Stop that, you sleeveen! And don't call me Freddy! I'm Mrs Butler to you! Elfrida shook her tambourine fiercely in Timmy's face, nearly knocking him off the bike, while Carl went crazy at the sight of the spinning spokes. Off the highway into this bedlam came a motorbike doing 120 kph. Wayne swerved sharply around the group in the middle of the road and careened on round the corner where he skidded on the gravel shoulder and struck a rock. He went head over heels. Still astride the bike, over the guardrail, down the cliff and into the deep water below. Dr Morrison managed to pull Elfrida free from Timmy, who was now laughing hysterically. He took the candy canes, gave one to Timmy, and beat a hasty retreat with Carl. Timmy rode away, sucking the candy cane, pleased with his little victory. Elfrida looked round, startled, suddenly aware that something strange had happened then shrugged. Too much traffic, she muttered. Someone could get killed. And she hurried on down the road after the professor. Well, there's quite a few characters there that we could have a little think about. There's Elfrida, who seems to be a sort of pillar of the community. If we could put it that way, everybody knows her. How how do we feel about people like that? And then there's Timmy, who isn't quite a man in his 30s or more, but isn't exactly a boy. Um, what sort of a person is Timmy and his mother, who seems very caring? And then there's the professor, Dr Morrison. Have a little think about him. And why on earth did he settle in that village after having met Elfrida? Or maybe I'm being too judgmental. I'll leave you to think about that. Now then, I've got a poem that I've chosen to go with that story. Um, it's more a poem for these times that we find ourselves in. Things might be difficult, but um, this is a time when we can recharge our batteries a little, take stock of things. This poem's called Shape of Time, and it's by an Estonian poet called Doris Kareva. You aren't better than anyone. You aren't worse than anyone. You have been given the world. See what there is to see. Protect what is around you. Hold who is there beside you. All creatures in their own way are funny and fragile. The question isn't how to be in style, but how to live in truth in the face of all the winds. With mindfulness, courage, patience, sympathy. How to remain brave when the spirit fails. Idleness is often empowering. Recreating oneself, just as the moon gradually grows full once again. 
a battery surely and steadily recharges. So everything, everyone must have time for the self, for mirth and laziness, time to be human. Thank you. See you next time.